Wasn't that wonderful? Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Danielle. Now, many of you may not know, but may have sensed it, her native language is not English. If I could sing in Spanish as well as she can sing tonight, what a blessing. Beautiful song, God's Daily Sufficient Grace, which is what every one of us needs as we think about the topic tonight, the judgment. When we hear that phrase, it sometimes brings all kinds of feelings to the surface. Tonight, we're not just going to talk about the judgment, but why is there a need for a judgment? What does the judgment have to do with our character, God's character, the law of God? How can we have confidence in light of the fact that there is a judgment? We'll get the answers from God's word, but before we go any farther, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that we can look forward with confidence. And the phrase, the judgment, when we know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, should not awaken within us fear. But tonight, as we walk through this topic, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each of us in a way that we can understand and give me words that the message will be clear, but through all of it, you will be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When you think about the word or the phrase judgment or the very thought of a judgment, all of us feel in some way that's something I'd sure like to avoid. I was driving down Highway 57 one day on my way <clears throat> to a Heritage Singers concert. This is when I was not in the group any longer. And we were taking a group of friends that were here to St. Louis to sing with them. And I sang with them that evening. But I was so excited. We were moving right along. And I got pulled over by uh, Ohio Patrol, Illinois, Illinois Highway Patrol. And he said, well, the master sergeant clocked you at such and such a speed. Where are you on your way to? And I said, well... What do you do? And I told him, he says, driver's license, registration, and I got a ticket. Well, on the ticket it says, uh, you could do one of two things, just send the funds in or appear before the judge. And well, you know, I thought, well, I wasn't doing anything terrible. I was just going a little bit over the speed limit. Just let me see if I could beat this thing. So I, <clears throat> being a pastor, I went, got, went to court with my nice suit on right there in the Benton Square. You know, I want to look a little legitimate. I wanted to figure if I look legitimate, maybe the judge might say, he's an upstanding looking guy. Just go ahead and let him off free. Well, I walked in and everybody was sitting there, some out on overalls, some out on jeans, and I looked like I was a lawyer. But my name got called. And I stood, he said, when your name is called, stand up. And he only, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? I thought, he said, no explanations. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? Bah, bah. No explanations. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? <sighs> guilty, with an, with, have a seat. My, seat made, my suit made absolutely no difference. <laughs> he didn't really care what I looked like. Were you guilty or not guilty? Well, now I declared guilty. I didn't want justice. I wanted mercy. I'm thinking, man, I, it's embarrassing. I look like I could be everybody's lawyer in here, and I just had to declare guilty. Well, my time came to go up to the judge, and it's, it's, the trial date is set, and I'm thinking, trial date? I just was going seven miles over the speed limit. Why a trial? What's that all about? Showed up in court, and they said, well, here's a fine paper. And, and I want to tell you, praise God for this. I don't want to activate the, the, the hatred of the powers of darkness, but I haven't had a ticket in more than 20 years, because I realize they're serious. And so tonight, when we think about the judgment, we think, will my suit make a difference? Will the way I appear before the judge make a difference? Why did I appear before the judge? Because I violated, his, I violated the law. You see, there would be no judgment if God's law, and I want you to get this, if God's law was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way and no longer applies, there is no need for a judgment. Amen. So if you believe that God's law no longer applies and your church teaches that God's law no longer applies, then you are going to face a judge and it's going to shatter your 
complacency when you realize that God's law has not been abrogated. Why would man and every government, small little munici municipal towns, no matter how big they are, no matter how small they are, they all have laws. Why would God establish a kingdom and have absolutely no law by which we will be judged? Well, tonight, we're going to go to the lesson and ask God's word and the spirit of God to guide us in our understanding. If you don't have a question or a lesson, go to Final Movements and download the question, The Judgment, or the lesson entitled The Judgment. Let's go to question number one. And if you have it, follow along. You could fill the answers in, or you can do it a little later. Question number one. What does the Bible teach about the characteristics of God's throne? When the Bible says, when we stand before the judge, he's sitting on his bench. When we stand before God, he's going to be sitting on his throne. What does the Bible say about the characteristics of God's throne? What's the first word? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. And I like this part. Notice justice or mercy. Mercy and truth go before you. If you are innocent, you ask for mercy. You ask for justice. If you're guilty, you ask for mercy. Question, how many of us are guilty? All of us. That's why the Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Such an appropriate song that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm so thankful tonight that God is not just a God of justice, but a God of mercy. You see, God's court is based on righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. One more time, righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. It's all there, and God is a just God. Look at question number two. What are we told about our appointment with God in the judgment? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Notice, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or whether bad. We must all give, we, we must all give an account. And so you'll see, in light of what we've learned so far, <clears throat> there's no one that's going to be excluded. The wealthiest and the poorest, the most well-known and the most obscure, everyone that ever took a breath and walked this planet will have to give an account in the judgment. None are excluded from heaven's court. Now, why is there a need for a judgment? We'll put this in more detail later on. Lucifer and the angels that joined with him were evicted from heaven for injustice, for lies, for trying to overthrow the government of God. He's not going to allow anyone to come in unless they are cleared of guilt, Amen. unless they are exonerated, unless they are justified, and unless they are safe to enter into a perfect, sinless environment. Amen. But something has to happen. But in the process, every one of us must give an account for the way that we have lived. Now think about it. How many of you Right now, if somebody walked in with a box of files and they said, tonight I have in my possession the records of everything that everyone in here has ever done, who'd like to read it? <laughs> How many of you would like your record to be read by somebody else? It would be terrible, right? Be running for the hills, diving under chairs. No! We don't, nobody wants their junk put out there. Amen, somebody? I mean, we all want mercy. Amen, somebody? That's why, back, you know, black churches say, have mercy. We all want mercy. We all want mercy. Praise God. We may not be excluded, but we serve a God of mercy. And we'll find out tonight how you won't have to be fearful of the coming judgment. Question number three. How did Daniel the prophet describe the judgment scene? This is an awesome scene. We go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He's in vision now. He says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Can you imagine? He describes him. Just picture in your mind him coming to his judgment seat. His garment was white as snow, not black like the judge's robe. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Can you hear that flame just crackling as God only can sit on a throne that's lit up with fire? What a scene. 
And it says, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And watch this. And the court was seated and the books were opened. Just imagine standing in that setting. It's like. <laughs> and nobody can get you out of it. John, 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 John. Lo, McKeng, McKeng, McKeng. Resonating throughout the universe. Have you done what's written in your record, 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 record? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what happens at that moment. I'm going to tell you what happens at that moment. Hold on. Everyone's life record will be examined. <laughs> Everyone's. How many? Everyone. Everyone's. This is why when the day of Pentecost came and Peter was preaching to the Jews who had not yet accepted Jesus, notice what Peter said to them. Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and be what, friends? Converted. Converted. Look at this. That your sins may be what? Blotted out. Amen. Now, I know everybody's going to raise their hands. I know this is going to happen. How many of you want your sins blotted out? Yes. I, don't often, I don't often get 100%. I think I got it tonight. We all want our sins blotted out. Amen. We don't want those sins. What, what would be so beautiful is somebody opens your record. Okay. Bob Ease. Bob Ease. Bob Ease. There's nothing in here. Amen, Bob? Amen. That's what I want. We're going to find out how that happens. Your record can be blotted out. Your sins can be blotted out. But it will not if you don't repent and if you're not converted. Amen. Notice it didn't say if you just attend church. If you repent and are converted. You can't just profess. Your life has to be in harmony with, with what you profess. Amen. But now let's look at the next part. Who is the presiding judge in the judgment? Now, Years ago when I was growing up, I used to think that Jesus was my lawyer, the father's the judge, and Jesus is saying, come on, Dad, give him a break. And God is saying, no, 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 no. And some people have this picture of God that he's just this guy with a, like a 37,000 times high-intensity digital binocular just look. There, I got you, Ron. Thought you thought nobody was watching. <laughs> Write that down. Ah, the books. You'll have to answer. No, that's not God. Some of us fear God like he's this mad, angry guy up there just waiting to get us. And it didn't help when you look at that artwork that was, I forgot what century was created, Dante's Inferno. Terrible picture of people just writhing endlessly in the fires of destruction. And they picture that that's what God is going to do to sinners. That's not God. Amen, somebody. Amen. There is a judgment fire, but... Matthew makes it clear, hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen. So that's one party you don't want to break into. You don't want to feel upset that your name is not on the guest list. Amen, right? Amen, right? How come they didn't sit there? Oh, no, it's just the devil and his angels. Oh, but we got some other people that want to come. Who are they? Well, some of them live in Thompsonville, some from New York. Man, we got a whole lot of people on earth that want to come. Really? Make room, you got guests. I don't want to be on that guest list. What about you? Not me. But here's what the Bible says. Who's going to be the judge? Look at this. John 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed how much judgment? All judgment to the Son. The Creator is the judge. We read that in our questions earlier tonight. Jesus was the active agent in the creation of the world, of humanity. The creator is the judge. But there's another reason why Jesus is the judge. is because Jesus is familiar with our weaknesses. He took on our flesh. 
He was down here. He walked where I walked long before I walked there. He understands our weaknesses. He's acquainted with sorrow and grief. And he bore all of our sins and took it to the cross so that we don't have to go and die for our own sin. He understands us. Isn't that good to know that? Can you imagine the judge, when you walk on the court, the judge says, I know what it's like. I understand everything you went through. You don't have to explain it to me because I went through something worse, but I went through it so that you can appear in my court and be exonerated. Amen. What a judge. What a judge. What additional duties, according to question five, does the Bible connect with our judge? This is amazing. This is going to blow you away because right now we're in the judge mode, but look at 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that, what? You may not sin. It didn't end there. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now this always, I love this part. I love this part. I've been trying to figure out how he's going to do that. Jesus is my lawyer and my judge. Because usually when you go to the court, you got the lawyer with you right here, and they said, judge is entering, everyone stand. Jesus is my judge, and Jesus is my lawyer. Doesn't that sound like a hung, doesn't that sound like a, 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 a stacked jury? Thank you, Leon. That sounds the court is stacked in our favor. You'll find in the book of Daniel, that when the scene of the judgment was over, this statement is there, and judgment was made in favor of the saints. So you got to get that sinner, got to get that sinner label out of your vocabulary. Because too, too many of us say, oh, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. If you were saved by grace, why are you still a sinner? Judgment was not made in favor of sinners. The judgment was declared in favor of the saints. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Not sinners. By God's grace, we, we can be, our standing before God can be changed from sinner to saint. Amen. Stop this. I'm only human. Just a man. Let me tell you something. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Paul said that. He says, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or a sword? No. No, he said, yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's why we like Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. How many things work together for good? All things. The Lord never, the Lord never declares something against his children. When you are his children, the court is set in your favor but not so fast. Hold on. Jesus, tonight, I've tried my best to make Jesus the central focus of all of my messages. Jesus is the only hope for sinners. Amen. Who's the only hope? Jesus. Without Jesus, you can have great set of beliefs, but if you don't know Christ, there's no hope. You got great intellectual connection, good study habits, but if Jesus is left out, there is no hope. He is the only hope. No man cometh unto the Father except through him. He ever liveth and makes intercession for us. Without Jesus, there is no hope. How did one say it? Uh, with Jesus is a hopeless, without Jesus is a hopeless end, but with, with Jesus is an endless hope. Thank you for, for bringing that back. Here it is, Daniel 7, 22. Did I read the question? Let me go back to it. How does the Bible reveal that the court is in our favor? Daniel 7, verse 22. Judgment was made in what? Amen. Favor of the saints, of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to what? Possess the kingdom. You know, people, you ever see people trying to get on a plane? Everybody wants to get on the plane at the same time. My wife and I are fortunate. We travel so much. We have platinum status, uh, platinum pro status with American Airlines. And... Um, when the, we, were, we were stuck in Dallas, and um, I was like, oh, are we going to get home? And they said, there's only two seats left. There's like 
all these people standing around. And we're thinking, we, we got to get home. They don't care whether you have to get home. They're going to deal with you like everybody else. And everybody's just standing like, you know, looking over everybody else's head. And they can see on the board, two seats remaining. It's like, and they said, uh, lo, Loma, uh, that's all I need to hear. Loma, don't, I don't care how you pronounce it. Loma, whatever. Call me Loma Hing, Loma Jane, whatever. Just so, finish it. Uh, J Loma, because it's just J Loma, A Loma. That's us. We got two seats. And, you know, it felt horrible. But, you know, like, when you're walking in, you, when you're walking in the New Jerusalem, you're going to be glad that your carcass has been saved. Amen. 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 You ain't going to be worried about nothing. I mean, let me get back and get dignified. You're not going to be worrying about anything. You're going to be glad that your name was. So we walked in. We kind of felt bad for those that left out. We didn't even look back because we didn't want to see anybody's face like <laughs> We just went in and sat down humbly, and we looked at each other. We're going home. Amen. We're going home. Amen. That's beautiful. The Lord gives us platinum pro status. Amen? Amen? When you are children of the Most High God, you don't have to fear the judgment, and you're not going to be left behind Amen. like that lying theory of the secret rapture t tries to tell you. That's a terrible thing. You see those people left behind crying all over the churches, I've seen a trailer for this upcoming lying movie about being left behind. The devil tries his best to make people think, oh, you're going to be left behind. Pastors all angry. I didn't make it. Members are crying. People are rolling over the church. We got left behind. We're all lost. What a terrible thing to tell folk. The Lord's not leaving his children behind. That's why I love 1 John 4, verse 17. Look at this. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have together boldness in the day of judgment because, because as he is, that's present tense, so are we present tense when? In this world. We are like our father now. He's working it out in us. And Philippians 1, 6 says, he who has begun a good work is going to do what? what? Complete it. Ron, what does it say? Complete. He's going to finish what he started. Amen. God never walks off of the job site and says, well, I've run out of time. Oh, no. He's going to finish what he started. Yeah. So when I don't even feel like a Christian, God says, I ain't done yet. Right. Amen. Amen, Sue? Amen. Don't worry about it. Stay on, the, stay on the conveyor belt. Some other folk might look all Christian before you. Stay, on the, stay in the process. Yeah. And here's the other thing. Don't worry about other folk. That ain't where you are yet. Amen. That's the problem with some of us. Look at them, attitude. Well, God didn't take care of the attitude yet. Let God deal with somebody else's attitude, not you. Amen. There is no fear in the judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God for that. God. Number seven, what does the Bible reveal to be the standard of the judgment? This is very important. There's got to be a standard in the judgment. You know, when you go to the courts, uh, my wife and I, we were driving through Alabama once. This is when we just got our car. It's 10 years old now, but it's, it still drives really, really good. Nothing wrong with it. And um, we, were, we were driving through Alabama. I'm, I'm going to share a funny story. So I'm, I was so tired because I did a camp meeting in Tennessee, then drove all the way down to Alabama and spoke for a whole week at, a, at one of the health retreats. And I was just worn out. I was tired. And we stopped along the way. And I said, honey, I'm, she said, are you tired? I'll drive. So she's driving, and it's like quiet. I felt like I was floating. I'm thinking, wow, this is quiet. I woke up. Andrew was driving 104 miles an hour. <laughs> I said, honey, we're in Alabama. Do you not know that the judge is the police and the police is the attorney and the attorney owns the jail? That one guy has everything. They stop you out here. We're going to be out here for a long time. You better slow it down. <laughs> Thank the Lord they didn't catch you. Amen. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but um, why is that? No matter how small the town is, the laws apply to everybody. You remember Smokey and the Bandit years ago? <laughs> Sheriff Buford or whatever his name is. You don't want Sheriff Buford to put up because it may be a small, like five people in town, but they got laws. Everybody got laws. Everybody has a standard. God also does. But here's, here's what the Bible reveals as God's standard. Look at this. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. And I love the way it puts it in context because people like to argue. 
The wise man Solomon uses a word that's so apropos. He uses the word conclusion. After all of your argument, here's what he says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, or the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every what? Secret thing, whether good or evil. Nothing getting by. But if you are under the influence of the Spirit of God and you want to live your life in harmony with the commandments of God, He will give you the power to do that. Am I right? Amen. How much can we do through Christ? All. All things. Don't ever say, man, those commandments are hard. It is if you try to keep it in your own strength. And people that don't want to keep the commandments, they try their best to pick it apart. But there is no government without a law. And don't ever try to communicate that God's government is the only government without law. That's a lie from the pits of darkness. That's why, I mean, just, it's like a mosquito always going around my ear when I hear pastors say God's law has been nailed to the cross. You know that? You think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like to me, an irritating mosquito or a gnat just flying in my face when I hear pastors that claim to be, that claim to be men of God saying God's law has been nailed to the cross and no longer exists. That's a demonic lie. How dare them say that God's government is the only government that's lawless? No, he said, depart from ye, ye who practice lawlessness. If they're practicing lawlessness and God's government has no laws, they'll fit perfectly in. But he says, no, I don't know you. Why? 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2, verse 4. From my memory, he who saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's God's word. Don't fall for that lie. Because if you do, you'll all of a sudden be pulled over by that divine agent called the Holy Spirit will drag you off the court and you'll stand before the judge with no excuse because Jesus has not been the one you chose to have your sins blotted out. We are told also in James 2 and verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Notice, why does it call it a law, a law of liberty? When you are living in harmony with the laws of the land, you don't drive down the highway freaking out because you see a state trooper, do you? You say, how you doing, officer? Some people like, you know, people know the police. How you doing, officer? Doing fine. You know, when you're keeping the speed limit, you don't mind walking to the store and the highway patrol is having lunch with you. How you doing, officer? Doing fine because you're a law-abiding citizen, right? But if you did something wrong, you know, thieves are always looking over their back. <laughs> Guilty folk live that way. But when you live in harmony with God's law, it's called the law of what? Liberty. Liberty. Liberty not bondage. Another lie. God's commandments are not bondage. They're not burdensome. But God's law is the standard of the judgment. If it were not, what are they going to judge you by? Your looks? Some of us wouldn't make it. I don't know why I said that, but by your financial prowess, by your bank statement, by your credit? What is the standard if it's not God's law? It's not, your, it's not going to be your financial bank account. It's not going to be how well people like you. There has to be a standard. Amen? Amen. And when is a standard, it applies to how many? Everybody. Everybody. Can't buy your way out of that. I read in Psalm 73 where Asaph, a young musician, got so upset by all the prosperity of the wicked. I mean, he was so angry. And then the Lord took him into the sanctuary where he saw their end. And then he realized, Lord, I was foolish to be feeling that way. God is a good God. He wants all of us to be saved. Amen, somebody. So God's law is the standard of judgment. And here's what the Bible also says. And this is important. Matthew 12 and verse 37. Notice what it says. For by your word you will be what? Justified. And by your word you will be what? Condemned. Man, I tell you, I found the perfect picture. Our words reveal the condition of our heart. Doesn't he look worried? So here's the key. You got to be nice to folk. Be nice to people. 
Speak nicely. Somebody once told me years ago, whatever you say, make it soft and sweet because you might have to eat it. Amen. Be nice to people. Don't, make, don't feel as a burden to be kind to folk. You better be glad I said hi to you. <laughs> be glad. For that to come from a Christian, there's something wrong with the heart. Our words will also be a part of the judgment. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. So we have to speak and do as those who will be judged by the law. And for those of us that talk a lot like me, I have a lot to answer for. That's why there's some people that you meet, they don't ever talk. It's like, mm hmm There's some people that won't have much to repent of because they never talk. People like me, I got to go home every night and confess, Father, what did I say today? Help me with it. Because we will be judged by our words. Be kind in our words. Amen? Amen? Let your words reveal your heart. Because whether you want it to or not, it will. How does the Bible reveal God's fairness? Look at Galatians 3, verse 28. Is God fair? There is neither, together, Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. God, friends, is an impartial judge. Doesn't care what country you came from. That's why I was growing up in New York City. We went to church with all kinds of people from the Caribbean. Don't ever call a Jamaican a Trinidadian. You don't ever call a Trinidadian a Barbadian. I was like, they were so loyal to where they came from that they forgot where they were headed. Forget about where you came from. We're all headed in the same direction. Am I right? Focus on the life that is indicative of people heading to the kingdom. Not where you came from, but it's where you're headed. And the life you live should indicate where you're headed. So speak and so do as those that will be judged by the law of liberty. God is impartial. Ezekiel 33 verse 17 says it this way. Because the Israelites always had a problem with God. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord is not fair, but it is their way which is not fair. You know, the rebellious heart always sees God as unfair. And I must add this. So when, when people say, why did God take my child? God is not a divine assassin. God's not taking folk. Be careful that we speak in a way that makes God seem as though he's, he's, he's a bad guy on some days and a good guy on others. Let's not forget there's an adversary. There's a devil. There's a demon. There's a Satan. There's fallen angels. Blame them, somebody. Amen? Amen. Put the blame where it is. You know, so it's like a poodle in the house that just doesn't even wake up and somebody gets bitten and you say, the poodle did it. The poodle, that poodle hasn't left the house. It's like, oh, I didn't do that. And a German shepherd outside salivating with somebody's clothes all ripped up in front of him. That's who did it. Put the blame where it belongs on our adversary, the devil. Why do people feel that way? Look at Matthew 24, verse 12. This is the attitude that people have that God is not fair. And because lawlessness will abound or iniquity will abound, the love of many will do what, friends? Grow cold. This is so important. If you're, we're living in the day and age where this is being fulfilled. Some folk are just cold. Here's a bulletin. Don't wait for them to warm up before you get warm. Amen. Don't think that you have to be like them. If other folk are mean and short and cold, you don't have to be mean, short, and cold. The Bible says by being nice to them, you're heaping coals on their head. And don't feel that you have to pay folk back. Vengeance belongs to who? To God. Because I want to tell you, nobody could get folk back better than God. Why does he do it? Because he'll give them all the rope they, all the rope they need. Us, we'll give them like, okay, they got one more chance. That's us. They got one more chance. They look at me bad, they're going to see me, right? <laughs> we don't give folk chances. Am I right? Am I being honest? We give people like, okay, they got one more chance. God, he gives them more. Isn't God good? You, like you, you mess up this week, give you another chance next week and next week. That's what he means, long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. Only God can do that. Don't ever lose your Somebody said, I'm going to give you peace of my mind. You know what the danger of that is? After a while, you won't have any more mind. 
Because some folk like to give out pieces of their mind. What happened to him? He gave all his mind away. <laughs> Keep your mind together under Christ. Look at number nine. Number nine. What criteria must we meet to have confidence in the time of the judgment? John 3, verse 18. Oh, this is so beautiful. He who believes in him, what does it say? Is not condemned. But he who does not believe is what? Condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of the only begotten Son of God. Let's not make any mistake. Believers are not condemned. Can you say amen? amen. But non believers are already condemned. Why does it say that? He who has the Son has life. So now somebody might think, well, then what if they're not acting in harmony with their profession? There's a text for that also. But you, but, you, but you are taken off of death row, and the Lord gives us the responsibility and the accountability to now live a life indicative of a free man or woman. But what the passage means is, if you don't believe in the Lord, you can't work your way into his favor. You've got to be his son or his daughter. You have to be in his will. You have to put self aside and declare your life to be the life of one who needs a savior in order not to be condemned. If you don't believe, you're condemned already. That's why John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why didn't he not send Jesus to condemn us? Because we're already condemned. Amen. You don't go to jail to tell somebody, Hey, did you know you're in jail? That's not what our prison ministry is, right, Bob? We go to bring freedom to people that are incarcerated. We don't go and say, Hey, did you know you're in jail? They won't want you to come visit them. Am I right? They want to hear about freedom, not incarceration. Number 10. Let's go on. Why is a verbal confession of Christ not sufficient to secure salvation? James 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead or is dead also. Profession must be affirmed by our works. Faith is affirmed by our works. If somebody says, I'm a carpenter, but they never build a house. I thought you were a carpenter. Yeah, I'm a carpenter. Have you built anything? Nope. Who do you work for? Nobody. You have any tools? Nope. Where do you work? I stay home. I could be a carpenter. Well, that's what I think I am. <laughs> well, where's, your, where's the evidence? You built anything in your life? Nope. What do you do every day? Eat cereal and watch television. Well, how could you be a carpenter? Well, that's my, that's my opinion about me. Some people are Christians only by profession. And they live opposite to their profession. But when you are in harmony, Hebrews chapter 11 is the perfect example because that's where that came from. Matter of fact, James talks about this. But in Hebrews 11, it speaks about those who not only professed God, not only professed to be followers of God, but their lives were in harmony with what they professed. Amen. And here's the good news. They didn't get there overnight. They got there through trial and tribulation, but they were determined by God's grace to continue the journey. That's why Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. You got to keep fighting the fight of faith, not the fight against forces of darkness because you can't win. You got to fight the fight of faith. Hold on, and you'll make it through by God's grace and strength. Number 11, will our words, will our words join our works in our judgment? Oh, yes. Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Repeating this, we're adding the earlier passage to it. For by your words you'll be what? Justified. By your words you will be what? Condemned. So you sit before that person that's going to be your advocate They'll say, did you say this? And you know what? If you have somebody representing you, an attorney always says, you got to tell me everything. Don't, don't, I don't want to go into court and something comes up that I'm not aware of. You get, you, if anybody you need to be open with and tell me all your junk, it's me. Because I need to find a way to defend you. Amen? Amen? Here's my point. Don't try to hide stuff from Jesus. He already knows it. 
And the devil makes you feel so bad when you mess up that you don't want to come to the Lord. People that mess up, they do just like Adam and Eve. They go hide in the bushes, putting their fig leaves of excuses on. No, when he says, where are you? Come on out and confess. He's not coming to condemn you. He's coming to exonerate you and liberate you. Amen? Amen. But be open with God. Don't try to say, I think I made a mistake. Say, no, Lord, my choices, my choices offended you. That's why Joseph says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Amen. Don't make sin an excuse. Know that sin is a choice. Why must, question 12, my, why must the judgment be finished before Christ returns? Got to go faster now. Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my what? Reward. Reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. How many of you ever received a passing grade before the final test? <laughs> you don't get a passing grade in January. You get it around June just before school closes. Here's the point. We must all be examined <clears throat> excuse me, and pass the test before the reward. When we finalize that, when we finish the test, then the reward is with us. This is the evidence that we must be examined before Jesus returns because he comes back with his reward to give to us according to our work. And by the way, let me make it clear. We don't gain salvation because of our work, but our work is a testament to whether or not our profession is in harmony with our work. Amen. Jesus brings his reward with him. <clears throat> Now, we're going to get into something that many of you may not see coming. Many people think, well, how much time do we have before the judgment begins? Well, I got some news for you now. The judgment is going on now. Amen. We're living in the last days, and according to the book of Daniel, we can now know when the judgment began and how we're living in the time of the end. Question number 13. According to the Bible, according to the Bible, when did the judgment begin? Yearly, now let me take you down a historical path very quickly. Yearly, the Jews knew <clears throat> that once a year, they faced a day called the Day of Atonement. Breaking it down, the Day of at one meant. It meant when their sins were blotted out on the Day of Atonement, they were now at one with God. And before the Day of Atonement, the trumpets were blown. When they knew that they were approaching the Day of Atonement, it was a solemn time a time of examining their lives, of providing a sacrifice that their sins may be blotted out. And so the Bible, in the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and chapter 9, we're going to look at that very quickly tonight, it shows us that as the Jews knew that this time of judgment was approaching, so we also can know when the time of judgment for us is approaching. Because when the day of judgment came for them and the work of that year was completed, then the sanctuary was cleansed. Amen. And all those sins that were confessed daily were blotted out. Amen? Amen? But how do we know when the judgment will begin for us? Daniel 8, 14, the question was asked to one of the angels. And the answer was given to Daniel. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be what? Cleansed. So let's walk through this tonight. The earthly sanctuary or the earthly tabernacle was where these daily sacrifices took place. But the fulfillment of the 2300-year prophecy leads us to the judgment hour. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. There would be no hour if there wasn't a time predetermined. Amen. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. There would be no time for the judgment to begin the time has come. It wouldn't come unless there was a predetermined time. So we now begin to break down this entire prophecy. And we're going to see a chart that you'll be able to walk through with me to understand clearly that we know that we're living in the time of the judgment. This 2,300-year period, from the time that this period began all the way to the culmination of this period, will take us from the beginning to the time the judgment begins. But a short portion of that was allotted to the Jewish nation. Amen. And they were given certain things that they must do in preparation for the coming Messiah. They were given 490 years. Here's how Daniel 9 and verse 24 begins to break this down. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your what? Holy city. How many days in a week? 
70 times 7 is what, friends? We have all the, math, all the mathematicians, 490. So Daniel was told, your people and your holy city, you have been given 490 days. And in prophecy, a day equals what? A year. But here's what they were told. Six things that they were told that must be done within that time frame of 490 years. Daniel 9, 24. I'll just break them down. You can read them in detail in your own leisure. The first one, to finish the transgression. Boy, when you read the Old Testament, man, Israel was stuck in one transgression after the other, after the other. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's the process of how it happens. Number four, to bring in what kind of righteousness? Everlasting, everlasting righteousness. Now, let me pause here. Can everlasting righteousness be without Jesus? Oh, no. Absolutely not. Men cannot arrive at everlasting righteousness without one whose righteousness is everlasting. To seal up vision and prophecy, and here's the other one, and to anoint the who? Most holy. So let's walk together through this. And you'll understand and appreciate this because many people have said, I still don't understand it. Tonight, you will. Let's look at the overview from the very far left to the far right. On the very top, you have 2,300 days or 2,300 years. And there's a smaller portion, 490 years or 70 weeks. And we just read in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined for just the Jewish people. So now let's look. Let's break it down. We're going to go to four a, B, C, D, and E. Let's start with A. When does the 2300-year 20, prophecy begin? Daniel 9, verse 25. This is very methodical. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until, what's the next word? Messiah, Messiah the Prince. There shall be, let's look, at the, let's look at the segments, there shall be how many weeks? Seven, Seven weeks and what else? 62, 62 weeks. And then we find this declaration when you read the book of Nehemiah. There were three decrees to rebuild. One was by Cyrus, one was Darius, and the other one was by Artaxerxes. Now Cyrus gave the decree to build the walls. Darius gave the decree to build the temple. But only Artaxerxes gave the decree to rebuild the walls, this economic system, its systems of laws. When you begin at Darius and Cyrus, the prophecy never completes. You come up with an incomplete prophecy, and you figure out what happened to all the time. And those are the two dates that many, if not most, evangelical pastors start with, so they never get this prophecy finished. And those are the ways, Darius and Cyrus prophecies, that I'm going to just drop something in there and pull, pull back out. Francisco Ribera and Luis de Alcazar, two Roman Jesuits, used those beginning dates to spin the theory today known as the secret rapture. Because if you follow those beginning dates, you never have a completed 490-year period. You always miss a year. You always miss one week, seven years. So they use that to say, this is when the secret rapture is going to occur. And all that stuff that has been discombobulated and put together to make people believe that they're going to disappear, that's how they did it. They misinterpreted the prophecy. But when you let the Bible speak, you understand that it had the right beginning date and every aspect of it was complete. Amen? Amen. Let's begin with it. Let's look at the decree. Nehemiah 2 and verse 5. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me where? Judah. To Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may do what, friends? Rebuild, Rebuild it. And that decree was given in the year, let's now put all the points together. That decree was given in the year 457 B.C., the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild and restore. But now remember, we had seven weeks and 62. How much is seven and 62? 69. 69. So why did it break it down in segments? Because there are certain intervals that something will be fulfilled. Let's look at this. We're going to go and bring up B in. So the reason why seven weeks and 62, you see it there, 49 years, 434 years, seven weeks and 62. Follow me carefully. This is math, simple math. When the decree was given in 457 B.C., Jerusalem was completed in 408 B.C., exactly 49 years after the decree. It was completed. 
So how many do you have left? 434. How many do you have left? Say it. 434. Let's go to point B. The prophecy reveals that 434 years after rebuilding of Jerusalem, the Messiah would be what? Anointed. Let's look and see what happened. Did Jesus come when he should have 434 years after the rebuilding of Jerusalem? Let's see what happens. Let's follow carefully. Luke chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was what? Baptized. He was also baptized. And what does that mean? Let's look at Acts 10, verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with what else, friends? And with power. So we're going to go back to point B, but I'm going to outline it in bullet points, and then we'll go back and see how it's been fulfilled. Jesus was anointed by baptism in 27 A.D., 15 years after Tiberius Caesar began to reign in 12 A.D. Do the math. What's 12 and 15? 27. Let's look at our chart on the screen. Here it is. So, the decree given in 457 B.C., the walls in Jerusalem rebuilt by 408 B.C. That gives us now 434 years, which should now bring us to the Messiah. Jesus was baptized in the year 27 A.D. 434 years after Jerusalem was being rebuilt. Let's go on further. According to Daniel 9... What was the next event to be fulfilled? Here it is. Daniel 9, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, what will happen? Messiah, Messiah shall be what? Cut off. cut off. But not for himself. Well, who would he be cut off for? Let's look at Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was, say it together, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, who's healed? We. I am. I love that, Bob. I am healed. By his stripes, sit together, I am healed. So let's put it together now. Let's look at it again. Going back to the chart, we're now at point C. Jerusalem rebuilt, Jesus anointed in 27 AD, and then. He was to be cut off. But when was he to be cut off is the question. Let's go to point C and see it clarified because was Jesus cut off? Was he crucified? Let's see what the Bible says. According to Daniel 9, how long would Jesus, how long would the covenant of Jesus be confirmed? Daniel 9, verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for how long? One week. How many days in a week? Seven. Seven. But look at this. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and what else? Offering. What's half of seven? Three and a half. Three and a half. Now let's go back to the chart. I try to make this simple that a baby can understand it. A, B, and C. Jerusalem, decree to start rebuilding, completed 408 B.C. Jesus in 27 A.D. was anointed by baptism, but three and a half years into his ministry, in the middle of the week, three and a half years later, was he crucified? Yes, in the middle of the week. The Bible makes it very, very clear. But here's the question. So far, we're right on target. Amen? Amen. But here's the question. How could Jesus confirm his covenant when he returned to heaven in 31 AD after only three and a half years' ministry? How could he have confirmed his covenant? Let's look at this. I hear you, Bob. Bob is a sharp man. So I've now highlighted this entire area in green, and let me tell you why I highlighted that. This is the most significant seven-year period, I would say, in Christian history. Amen. Why? Jesus was baptized. Say amen. amen. Jesus paid the price for our freedom from sin. Amen. Amen. And then his covenant was finally confirmed. Let's find out. We're going to go back to this green area because there's something that I'm going to sneak up on you with. 
Did he confirm his covenant? Hebrews 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by who? The Lord. And was confirmed to us by those who did what, friends? Who heard him. We can go now to point D. The covenant of Jesus, the covenant that Jesus made with the Jews was confirmed by his disciples for the last three and a half years of probationary time. Before I go to the next slide, I'm going to just make the point very clear. That's why when Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, before that pouring out of the Holy Spirit, you know what he said? Go first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Amen. Why go to them first? Because their time is not yet fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles had not yet come in. But when they rejected Jesus, Paul and Barnabas was in Antioch, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 13, verse 42 to 46. You can look it up yourself. He was preaching on the Sabbath, and the Jews said to Paul, that was a good sermon. That was powerful. They persuaded him and encouraged him to continue. But the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear that message. And when the Jews saw almost the whole city come together, they were filled with envy. They were angry. They started accusing Paul and contradicting what he said the week before. And Paul said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is ridiculous. And then he said, it was necessary that the word of God be given to you first. But seeing that you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles for a specific reason. So let's look at the point D. I'm going to confirm it even farther. The 490 years allotted to the Jewish nation was fulfilled in what year? 34 A.D. The final appeal to the Jews was through Stephen. Let's bring that chart back up again and focus on the green area because that's the most significant time frame in Christian history. And you'll find out in just a moment. The covenant was confirmed the covenant began by Jesus and confirmed by his disciples. So all of that week was completed. Was it completed, yes or no? Yes. Did Jesus begin his ministry? Yes. yes. Was he crucified? Yes. yes. Was Stephen stoned? Yes. yes. That's scripture. Did the gospel go to the Gentiles? Yes. yes. So, Stephen, what did I say? Stephen. So was Stephen stoned? Yes. So the whole seven-year period was completed. Praise the Lord. Amen. According to Daniel 8.14, what would happen after the 2,300-year period expired? Listen to what he says. Back to Daniel 8.14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Let's look at point E. We're going to go to that now. The cleansing of the sanctuary was the final step in the blotting out of the sin problem. The 2,300-year prophecy ended in what year? 1844. We're going to go to the chart two more times, and this is the reason I'll tell you right here in a moment. That green area, the most significant time in the history of Christianity, it points to Christ. Repeat back what I said. It points to who? Christ. One more time. It points to who? Christ. Okay. You said that for a reason. Look at this. The final phase in the dealing with the sin problem began in 1844. After its completion, the heavenly sanctuary will be cleansed of what? Sin. Now, why I say heavenly? Because when the sanctuary was built, Moses was told to build it according to the pattern that he saw in the heavens. Amen. That earthly temper, that was temporary until Jesus came. And when Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. You remember that? Yeah. So that came to its end. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled all that the Bible said would be pointing to his earthly ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the gospel going to the Gentiles, all completed. But watch this. Does the Bible confirm we are living in the judgment hour? Revelation 14, verse 7. Look at this. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and do what, friends? Give glory, Give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. 
and look at the call back to true worship. And worship him who made what? Heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Just like Genesis chapter 2, just like Exodus chapter 20, just like Deuteronomy, De Deuteronomy chapter 5, calling us back to the worship of the Creator. Amen. What could that be? The three angels' messages is an announcement of the judgment hour. Amen, somebody. Amen. But the last time with the chart, because this is the twist. Let me tell you something. The devil does not want this prophecy to be understood. And here's what he did to try to truncate it. Look at this. You see that green area? That points to Christ. The seven-year period points to who, friends? Christ. The rapture, and now it's in red, many teach that the secret rapture applies to the seven-year period of the Antichrist and not the life of Christ. They've taken that seven-year period, which right now, as I stand here before you, as I stand before those of you watching, there's an entire series of books called the Left Behind series. You know what's been left behind? The truth has been left behind. Amen. It's a lie published. Millions of books have been sold. Millions for kids, for adults, the movie. And they keep repetitively over and over. They come, they're coming out with a new one soon to, 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 to duplicate and triplicate this lie that the devil wants you to think that if you miss the rapture, this is the lie. This is a lie, not scripture. They say, if you miss the rapture, at the beginning of the seven-year period, you'll have seven years left before Jesus comes again to take you back. They've taken the seven years that belong to the baptism, ministry, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, gospel going to the Gentiles. They've taken it from the Christ and applied it to the Antichrist. It's behind us, not ahead of us. Amen, somebody? And millions of Christians are waiting for the Messiah to show up somewhere down the road, and they teach that some Antichrist out of Europe somewhere is going to come and begin the seven-year period. Lies, lies, and more lies. I don't have time to tiptoe through the tulips. People's lives are on the line, and there are Christians tonight that are believing, well, when the rapture happens, it, it's so common, but no valid support from Scripture. As a matter of fact, my wife and I watched about 15 years ago National Geographic's we watched this program. It's just fascinating that they would even do an expose on it. National Geographic did a one-hour program on the secret rapture, and they said millions of Christians believe the secret rapture, which has no scriptural support. Amen. That's National Geographic. And I have an entire five-part DVD series, series that shows you where it came from, how it got developed, how it came into the Christian church, and why people today... And this is why you don't hear the judgment hour preached. This is why you hear phrases like this. Jesus could come any moment now. That's rapture talk. They say that because they don't have any cadence in scriptural prophecy. When you understand Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. He said, I'm not going to do anything unless I reveal it to you first. Amen. He's not sneak up, sneaking up on us. He wants us to know by the cadence and the chronology of prophecy that Jesus says this will happen. And he said to his disciples, when you see all these things coming to pass, know that your redemption draweth nigh. What should you do? Look up and lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. When you are part of a church that has no clue about prophecy, you live in this, he could come any moment now mode. Friends, don't take what applies to Christ and apply it to the Antichrist. Now, excuse me for being a little overpassionate, but I can't stand a lie that's tricking God's people, making them feel unready. Okay, calm down, John. I want people to know the truth. This passion is not for me. It's for those that are in darkness. Please follow God's word. And here's the reason why. Why is it imperative to have Jesus as judge and attorney? 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the what? Light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, does what, friends? Cleanses us from all sin. Fellowship occurs. Not because you like the music. Fellowship occurs. Not because you like the community programs. Fellowship occurs by walking in what? Light. The light. Not in good programs and in good music, but by walking in the light. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. Help me preach it, Bob. What happens if your name is not in the book of life? 
Revelation 20, verse 15. And anyone not found, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the what? Lake of fire. Lord, have mercy. And you know what? The Lord doesn't want you to be in the lake of fire. I told you, it's only for the devil and his angels. Don't be determined to break in, into that conflagration. It is going to consume sin and everything connected with it. You don't need to be in that. Jesus has made a way out. The book of life contains the names of the saved. Years ago in evangelism, we used to sing that song. I know Yvonne might remember. Is your name written there on the page bright and fair? In the book of the kingdom, is your name written there? Tonight, friends, my name is written there. What about you? Amen. I've accepted Jesus. My name is there. He's working on me now to get me ready for that kingdom. But my name is there. Amen. I'm not fearful tonight. He's got a lot of work yet, but he's going to finish it. Praise, praise the Lord. Has ample provision been made to save everyone? Yes. 1 John 2, 2. And he himself is the what? Propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for how much? The whole world. That means there's room for everybody to make it in if they would simply accept the propitiation, that substitutionary sacrifice, nobody but Jesus. Isaiah 45, 22, the words of the Father, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is what? No other. John 3, verse 17, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him together might be saved. Oh, friends, this message is so important to me. Jesus does not condemn us. He saves us. He condemns sin. But here's the last few questions. What does God establish as true worship to the Creator? What has He called us to do when He says, Worship Him who made heavens and the earth? What is that sign that He's calling us to remember? <laughs> Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Notice the language of the, of the angel of Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7 is synonymous to the angel is, to not, is synonymous to the voice of God in Exodus chapter 20, verses 11. Notice what it says. For in six days the Lord made, what? The heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the what day? Seventh. Seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and did what, friends? Amen. Hallowed it. And I'm going to make a statement of divinity. Sabbath is not an optional commandment. It wasn't, it wasn't added by mistake. It wasn't those tripped-up commandments. It's the only one that says, remember, and the devil says, please forget, because he wants to be like the Most High. Brother, we're in a battle. This ain't a picnic. This is the final battle. Number 19, what does judge, why does judgment begin at the house of God? 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, when? First, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment begins with those claiming to follow Jesus. If you lost your car keys, Gary, would you go to the neighbors down the road to look for your car keys in their house? You'll start where? In your own house. You'll start with your own family. Why does the Lord begin with us? We're the ones professing to know him. I'm not going to examine the neighbor's kids. You're the one that... That's why parents say, don't embarrass my name. You think the Lord is saying the same thing? Amen. Professing to know him, but living as though he doesn't exist. I have a book I wrote, I'm not wrote, but read not too long ago. It's called Christian Atheist. <laughs> Believing that God exists, but living like he doesn't. What an expose it was. It's called Christian Atheism. Believing like God, ex believing that he exists, but living like he doesn't. So, friends, here's the question. Does our profession match our lives? That's what the purpose of the judgment is. I know what you're saying, but how do you live? Number 20. What promise does Jesus make to those who accept his cleansing blood? Oh, how beautiful it is. Revelation 3, verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in what kind of raiment? White, White raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's right. We got angels, friends. 
We got angels. When you are living according to God's will, by God's grace, he says, that's a person I don't mind being in my kingdom. Father, let him in. Father, let her in. Amen, somebody? Amen. My blood has covered them. And he even says to the angels, you might be discouraged of what you see right now, but I'm not done with them yet. Even his angels, he confesses before them. Christ's righteousness covers our sin. Amen. Christ's righteousness covers our sin. And I believe this is the last one. How does the Apostle Paul describe the Christian victory? How does he describe it? For those who want to battle, here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. Can we all read this together? I love this. But thanks be to God who what? Gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh, I tell you, friends, we have victory in Jesus. Every Wednesday night we used to sing, victory in Jesus. We've got victory in Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know why? Because he, he is the only one that can change us. He is the only one that can cleanse us. He is the only one that can get us ready for eternal life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'm going to invite Ryan and Tim to come out. There's a song that I've asked Ryan to sing tonight called Changed. You know, friends, can Jesus change you? Oh, yeah. He doesn't just want to save you. He wants to change you. Amen. He doesn't just want to give you a, a seat in the church. He wants to give you a, a mansion in his kingdom. He wants to change you. So those of you online, here's the question. Those of you that are here, I hope you have your cards. Each night you got one of those. Please put your name and your phone number. Was the presentation clear? I pray that you put yes. But if it wasn't, put no. Would you like more information about the topic? If you'd like, yes. If not, put no. Number four, would you like to make a, would you like to make a commitment to be ready for the judgment? Can you put your hands up? Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's Jesus every day. Start the day, let them live in you, and you will be ready. No fear in the judgment. Would you like someone to pray with you or prayer requests? You've been putting those on the envelopes, and we've been taking those before the Lord. But tonight, as you think about it, those of you that are watching, I want you to think about the words in this song, because if we were not able to be changed, we couldn't make the kingdom. I'm thankful the Lord didn't just save me, but he changed me, and he's still changing me. Ryan, minister to us. Tim. him that day felt a new kiss on my face walked away eyes wide open could finally see where I was going it didn't matter where I've been I'm not the same man I was then I got off track made mistakes, backslid my way into that place where souls get lost, lines get crossed, and the pain won't go away. I hit my knees, now here I stand. There I was, now here I am. Here I am. Change. Got a lot of hey, I'm sorry. The things I've done, man, that was not me. I wish that I could take it all back. I just want to tell them that I got off track, I made mistakes, backslid my way into that place where souls get lost. And lines get crossed and the pain won't go away. I hit my knees, now here I stand. There I was, now here I am. Here I am. I've changed for the better. More smiles, that's better. I even started 
too forgive myself I hit my knees, now here I stand There I was, now here I am Here I am Here I am I'm changed I'm changed Yes I got off track, now here I am Slid my way into that place where souls get lost and lines get crossed and the pain won't go away. I hit my knees, now here I stand. There I was, now here I am. Here I am. Amen. What a song. You ever got off track? You ever made some bad choices? Aren't you glad tonight that when you get off track, Jesus keeps the tracks in place? His grace goes and looks for you, pulls you back on track. He said, son, I understand. I've been down here. I understand how tough life can be. Tonight, those of you that are watching, this thing about salvation is beautiful. I don't just want the Lord to change me. I don't want him just to save me. I want him to change me. I don't want to get into heaven angry and upset and vindictive and sour. I want to get into the kingdom reflecting the glory of the one who changed my life. But I'm going to ask you a question tonight. If you want what Ryan just talked about, because I know we've all gotten off track, and you want to know that change, that power to change your life, would you stand with me tonight? When I stand in the judgment and my name is called, they're going to say, Martin Luther talked about that once. He said he had a horrible dream. He woke up in, in sweat. He said he saw in his dream the devil accusing him, the devil accusing him. And the devil rolled out a scroll before him, and all of Martin Luther's sins were on that scroll. And as he was being accused, he said all he saw was a hand with a blotter. <laughs> Forgiven. Forgiven. I couldn't preach tonight if that wasn't the case. I couldn't talk about what I have not experienced. So tonight, if you're on that other side of that camera, you might be watching by yourself. You might be saying, I did get off track. I've been to places where I made terrible mistakes. Lines been crossed. Lies been crushed. Tonight, I want that new start in Jesus. I want to make a specific appeal to you. Go to that website. You'll see a section where it says, submit your questions. Put your name. Put your contact information. Tonight, if you want to accept Jesus in your life, put, quote, changed, and put your contact information. We want to be able to direct you to a church in your area where you can find a fellowship to know that others are there for the same reason, to be changed. Are we all here to be changed, friends? It's not that we are great sinners, but we have a greater Savior. There's nothing you have done that cannot come before the Father, and Jesus cannot change it. So tonight, as we raise our hearts to God, Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to come down here, finding folk off track, broken up, disappointed, fragile, not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. But like that relentless shepherd, you're on a mission to find your sheep. There's no night too cold that you wouldn't go out looking for us. 
There's no storm too great, no mountain too high, no valley too dark that has ever caused you to turn back from finding us. Tonight, I can say, by your blood, I've been changed. By your grace, I've been saved. By your mercy, I'm being prepared for that eternal kingdom. I don't fear the judgment, Lord. I fear being lost. And I want to be in that kingdom where perfect love casts out all fear. So tonight, Father, if there's anyone here this night that wants to know that they have that blessed assurance, you've got the Son, but even more than that, he's got you. And he'll work out his will in your life. And when the kingdom comes, you'll ascend to be with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Why? Because we have not just been saved, but by the blood of the Lamb, we have been changed. And all of God's people said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Savior.